So how is everybody's con going so far? It's not a con. <laughs> Don't say that. How's everybody's festival going so My far? festival is great. Great. Uh, we are uh, from a group called Content Productions, a loosely defined group. Uh, and we're here to talk about a topic that we've often discussed amongst ourselves. Uh, one of those, isn't it weird that topics in video games uh, that we're going to approach from a couple different angles. Hopefully it's of interest to you. The way the, this panel will go is we'll throw up a couple of um, examples of types of things that we're interested in and throw a couple of weird case studies and definitional concepts up. And then largely it'll be generated by us just having a conversation after that. Um, but we have a couple of things that we want to work through before that. Uh, before getting too far ahead, just to introduce ourselves, my name is Kevin Flanagan. Um, and you will be responsible for your introductions each. My name is also Kevin Flanagan. That's what you get. No, I'm, I'm Bobby Schweizer. I'm Adam Stackhouse. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we'll begin by talking about, uh, just kind of giving you an overview of what we hope to do today. Um, so I am, uh, I, I'm obsessed with two fundamental representational notions, I guess, but I, you, you can go down to coding levels to think about them if you want. Uh, things that define video game playing. Uh, thinking about this a couple months ago, I have been kind of stuck on the idea that so many games are about getting things on the one hand, collecting, taking, picking up, whatever, and that so many games are predicated on that action or set of actions. But also, in a more basic level, so many games are based on colliding with things and then becoming part of those things. So if we think about this as a thought experiment, so much of video game playing is steering into specific objects and either merging with them or eating them or getting them in your inventory or something. And so I want to think about the nuances of that, as insane as that sounds. And I know it might sound a little insane at the beginning. But I also want to think about games that kind of flip the script a little bit and talk about what happens when your goal is to get rid of things uh, and maybe a more zen-like approach to game playing, but also avoidance and evasion as a game mechanic and how some games are based on the notion of not colliding with things and how that kind of becomes an interesting uh, sidestep. And then also with games that combine the two in interesting ways. So uh, merging and crafting mechanics is something that I hope to talk about with all of you. And then also matching and destroying as part of puzzle games is kind of combining both of these things. Um, we each have a couple of weird, you know, kind of case examples, and then we're going to just throw it out there and think about uh, a bunch of other weird ways to approach this. So um, hopefully that about covers what we'll be doing, I imagine. So let's get into it. Uh, again, this is about maybe 10 or 15 minutes of throwing stuff out there uh, and then wanting to get through more things. This is something Bobby is going to talk about. Right. So when Kevin first posed this uh, panel to me, and I was thinking like, okay, you know, well, I've actually thought a lot about... Um, what this kind of collision-based uh, understanding of video games and where it comes from, because I've worked on a couple projects about it. Uh, I, teach, I teach game design and I've written some, some papers that are sort of related to it. And I thought, oh, this is actually really well described by uh, a concept called graphical logics of computers. So there is a paper by two UC Santa Cruz faculty members uh, Michael Mateus and Noah Wardrop-Fruin, and they wrote a paper about the operational logics of video games. And the idea of the operational logics is like, well, what are the things that we make most games about um, based on what computers are good at? And computers are good at manipulating symbols, and computers, as part of their history, have been good at representing places on a screen. So when we think about uh, objects that exist, have coordinates associated with them, and we act on those objects and move them around, and we see that feedback on the screen, that's why we get so many games that are about this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the, the first games that people make are things where, you know, you are in, say, like, computer space. And it's like, well, how do we, how do we manipulate this thing on a screen? Uh, and it's kind of like a rocket ship, and it moves in a particular way, but we don't have anything to do with it. Well, what if, you know, you can interact with it and have it uh, fire a missile at something? And, and how would that behave? Um, and even if you look at something like Tennis for Two as an early experiment with games, it is about trying to depict... Uh, tennis and it's about you know when does this ball collide with the side of the screen and do you press you know your little clicking button at the right time to get it to respond so the fact that we think about well yeah getting stuff is such a big part of games makes a whole lot of sense because we're computers are really good at 
portraying those images on the screen. And then we are good at using that as feedback to figure out where things are. So collisions are like a central tenant to, to what this is. Could you say something, though, about this visual example that you asked to include? It's the header symbol animation. And it's about how we use our imaginations on some level to compute this. Right? Has, has anyone familiar with uh, header symbol animation? I was like Googling words I knew. I was like, I know this thing exists in the world. What are all the words I knew? And I was searching for like angry triangles at one point. Uh, but this was an, an experiment done, and you know what? I should actually pull up the, the year it is. So this was an experiment done, and it was asking people if they were to look at an animation that has abstraction in it, um, how do they interpret what is going on in that animation without any other context? So in this animation, uh, let's see. Uh, so real-time research, folks. This is uh, 1940s. 1940s. Fritz Heider and Marianne Simmel. Uh, 1940s. And so they created these animations and said, like, well, what do you think is going on? And people largely constructed stories about how, you know, there's these triangles and one of them is protecting a house. And when the circle is inside of the house, then it's like clearly protecting like its baby. And then someone is trying to get into the house. And then the triangles have a sharp point, so they're dangerous. And so they were trying to understand a bit about psychology and abstraction. But that's what we do to make sense of collisions in games. It's like this thing over here touches this thing over here and this thing goes away, well, what does that mean? Well, like, it killed it. It uh, sent it to outer space. It made it turn invisible and it's actually still there. It could be like any number of things. So all the examples that we're going to talk about are ways of specifying how these collisions make sense based on what you're doing in the game. How do you make two objects that touch um, mean much more than that? Right, so um, what, we're, what I think I want us to maybe think about as I go through a couple of examples is how we take for granted and intuitively understand how this works as people who play games, and to stop to think about what it is that's actually happening on a kind of fundamental level makes it a bit weirder. So here is just a, a sense of some of the terms that we're going to be looking at, not all of them. Um, I threw up a lovely image from Retro City Rampage to, that is actually the most illegible image I could possibly have picked, so thank, you're welcome. Um, but it's, uh, you know, words like, and, and obviously a lot of these are verbs, but uh, take, pick up, gather, find, I'm really fascinated by the rhetoric of the word loot. Loot is a kind of weird cultural word right now. It, it's one of the OED is probably going to be grappling with how we kind of constantly redefine the term loot. Um, scavenge. I'm really interested. No, I'm, I'm not I just kidding. Just imagine people like mm, I don't. Mm. There, there are very uh, intelligent people somewhere who are kind of agonizing over <laughs> this as we speak. Um, I'm really fascinated, especially by um, the way that a kind of rhetoric of environmental kind of uh, responsibility has entered into the vocabulary, largely through popular game series like Fallout. Um, and then we'll also talk about you know, some of the things that uh, characters like Kirby do, where you kind of become one with or meld and, and things like this. So uh, I, I want to start maybe with the most simple thing. This, this you know, term comes into a lot of games. I chose an image from Shadowgate because, for whatever reason, the Shadowgate interface for the NES is like burned in my memory. It's just like a, a very clear way of outlining actions you can take. Um, but to take, uh, obviously in a lot of games, the action of taking is simplified by running over something. My favorite are games where you don't even need to do that. Your aura is such that objects are pulled to you, right? A lot of MMORPGs are like this. Or um, games where you know just proximity is the thing that enables you to get whatever it is. Sometimes there's a really kind of highfalutin way of you're you know, absorbing souls. If you take a step back and think about what does it mean to absorb a soul, your brain might shut down, but that's part of games. Um, Adam is going to talk more about this. I have less experience myself with adventure games uh, in a minute. Now, I had an image here from Conan Exiles about gathering, and it's blank. Well, and Someone took it. Someone took it. But um, another term that's, uh, I think, important when we think about this is, uh, you know, your, your gathering uh, is going to, again, sound insane when I have this, <laughs> this amazing slide up. But you're gathering kind of materials to, to um, combine for things, or you're gathering objects, or you're, you know, you're, you're, you know this is a word that we obviously associate with kind of um, early man and pre-agricultural societies. But... Um, I uh, named aside verb salad. I, I think talking about this as it works with adventure games is maybe the most interesting place to start. So, Adam, if you have some thoughts. That's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> I work in, uh, for a living with uh, interactive choose your own adventure installations in theater. Um, and I'm a big fan of the adventure game genre, point and click, modern graphical uh, visual adventure. 
And when Kevin, you know, was talking earlier about, hey, this is all about acquisition, I was like, well, you know, adventure games are uh, half acquisition. And it kind of, the, if you can see here, the examples that are thrown up, if you're familiar, on the left, you've got a bunch of box art from the early 90s LucasArts adventure games. Um, some of which you may be familiar with from when they came out or their recent remasters from modern consoles. On the right is a screenshot from Day of the Tentacle um, with a, a Harley riding character going back to George Washington times to solve uh, silly ass puzzles. Uh, the great thing about early adventure games when they are trying to figure out how do you uh, collect different things but also make that the core mechanic of the game is you have these grid uh, of nine different verbs. They switched up from game to game um, but they may say taste, bite, grab, pick up, use, throw and you would have to click verb to noun and it was kind of an early exploration at least through this genre of the kind of stuff Kevin's getting about. How do you literally acquire things in games and there's a lot more abstract you can get into with arcade and other um, you know, first person shooters and whatnot. But when you're telling a narrative based games with characters and the actual acts are to further the story and the puzzles of the game through the mechanics, they took the approach of having literal verb to noun use be the vast majority of the game, uh, being the entirety of the actual gameplay and the acquisition itself be essentially half of what you do because it's puzzles through acquisition and combination. Which so, get at. When, when I, so I don't, I have not really played adventure games, like point and click adventure games like this, and so I don't know the answer to this. Yeah. Um, the w other words that are on there that are not take, like when I think of adventure game, I think of just like go around, click on everything, grab it all, it's in your inventory, and go use it on everything else. Yeah. But all these other words, what are they doing with those objects that are making it more interesting than now, now I possess this thing? Like what is taste? Actually, mean. it's really funny you ask that because I would argue that it is it, adventure games, especially point and clicks, have a reputation of being one of the funny genres, of being one of the genres of video game where you're able to inject humor. Um, and you can inject humor in any game through comedic timing, dialogue, style, all kinds of different ways. But adventure games kind of naturally developed a sense of humor by dealing with that problem through their mechanics. So if you try to bite a cat, or you try to, you know, close a person. The characters <laughs> in the game will often Hey, don't react. tell me you've never tried to do that. <laughs> hey, I'm like, yeah, oh, come on. Uh, the characters in the game will react accordingly, often having specific lines of dialogues or, you know, and there's different times when you could do something inappropriate with an object in a game and it almost becomes an Easter egg. Like, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't put that hamster in a microwave um, would, would be an example. You should not. Um, I'm also fascinated by the specificity of some of the terms in this genre uh, about how they only work on certain objects at certain environments in certain ways and then how some words are so general as to cover up a lot of other problems so use is a really good example to me of a very general word that can apply to a lot of situations whereas if you were to talk about you know like I, earlier we we're talking swim you you can't really swim unless you are in water so that you know term and that associated action might have less usefulness right and it's also like when you pick those words that you're kind of committing to it. And sometimes when you look at something like Day of the Tentacle, which has all of those verbs, and then you follow it up with full throttle, and the idea is in full throttle they really simplified it, and you have uh, a mouth and a boot and a fist. And so it results in you kicking dumpsters and like siphoning gas because the puzzles are being built around these fewer verb-noun combinations. So uh, moving on uh, temporarily, but I would like to come back to this, especially if you all have experiences that kind of uh, bring interesting light to this. So I, like I said, I'm obsessed with this term loot. Um, obviously, a lot of you are familiar with the debate uh, as to the legal state of loot as to whether or not it's gambling, right? Um, loot is a word that I think originally you trace to things you get as spoils of war you take from enemies. Um, I think it's got this more kind of general term now through game usage as being spoils or treasure found even outside of warlike scenarios. Um, loot is a word that you loot bodies, you loot chests, you loot areas, but then also you have loot. So it's one of those interesting words to me where the action is the name of the thing. Um, I don't treasure when I open a treasure chest, I open, right? There's other terms there. Um, so I'm maybe interested in thinking as when we start to have our discussion about the ways in which this term has kind of changed and what 
what does it actually mean to loot? Do we all imagine a scenario where we're getting on our knees and carefully putting objects into a bag, or is there a more abstract sort of means of what looting actually is on a kind of definitional level? So anyway, hopefully other, others of you will go to bed just having the word loot circling in your head in some sort of bizarre way. Please let it be known that I don't hope that for you. Right, that, that would be very cruel. Another word that sort of is sort of obsessively used in a lot of ways is to mine, uh, not only because of the current popularity of things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but also because, uh, and also because of, um, you know, the prevalence of games that use it as a mechanic. But mining is and another- And also Minecraft. And also Minecraft. But uh, mining is another sort of thing where like to actually mine something, depending on the technology you use, might be an incredibly complicated process. And it may be a, an intricate process that requires more than one person with the pickaxe on a two-dimensional plane like in SteamWorld Dig. But I, I, it leads me to think about this thing about how video games more generally, this is an aphorism that we can start to disagree with, are about finding and getting things. If people were to say, what are you doing when you're playing video games? I'd say 90% of the time I'm finding and getting things. And I'm then exchanging those things for other things. And that my life is sort of consumed by getting one thing, taking it one other place, exchanging it for something else. Whether it be an actual monetary economy or whether it be just giving objects to people in exchange for access to new parts of a map or whatever it is. Um, so if, if, again, if you have an elderly relative who's like, what are video games? You can say, video games are about getting things and exchanging them for other things. That, and you're on safe ground. Yeah, that's going to go over super yeah. well. Yeah, I, actually, my wife asked me that, or she said that the other day, and I was playing something, and she goes, you play a lot of games that are about getting things. I was like, ah, uh, yes, all, yes, damn it, you're right. All these games are just about getting stuff. So uh, an, a challenge I have for everybody uh, assembled is to, we start to talk, thinking about games in which that is not the goal. What is a, what, what are goals when... Getting things is not the objective, and what might that look like? Uh, speaking of which, yes. is this slide yours? Yes, it is. Uh, incorrect answer. The correct answer was no. It's mine. Uh, <laughs> wah, wah. Okay, keep uh, going. Before we move on to this, though, like thinking about. <laughs> thank you, you're, you're Adam, Adam. Thanks you. You're yes. Um, as we think about like these different terms, so you've had you had take, you had collect, mine, loot. What was the other one in these big opening slides Get. here? Get, right? Like, if you look at something like Ms. Pac-Man and you ask yourself, well, well, which of these words applies to that game the best? Like, what is going on in that? Like, if you were to describe Ms. Pac-Man, like, it's a game where you play as Ms. Pac-Man and you get these little power pellets and then you get these other big power pellets so that you can get these ghosts so the ghosts don't get you and you get some fruit and snacks so you can get to the next level. And, like, you entirely describe it as get. But then you could say, oh, well, am I collecting the fruit? And what does it mean to collect? I always thought you were eating yeah, the fruit. Well, yeah. She's feasting. Yeah. But like, the, the fruit appears elsewhere. So does she digest it and then it appears in, in my, my record at the she, bottom? Is that how food works? She just got a baller metabolism, a numeric <laughs> metabolism, and she's locked in a buffet maze. That it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh -huh. By the way, if anyone wants to game, make a game called Buffet Maze, I would give you venture capital to do so. Um, collision. So we want to maybe even get more abstract for a second. Bobby just brought up this central problem where Miss Pac-Man is about colliding with objects and then avoiding other objects and then, you know, the things you collide with appearing in other parts of the screen. And if we didn't have the capacity to kind of read these codes, we, we would be very strange to us. So, you know, Super Mario Brothers is an example I think we're all familiar with where, you know, you are a, an avatar of a man and you uh, collide with a mushroom and whether or not you read the manual or what kind of imagination you have may say, do I eat the mushroom? Does it enter my boot? How do, what is the mushroom doing? In, right? Informal poll by show of hands, how many of you all think that Mario is eating the mushroom when Mario collides with the mushroom? What are some other examples? Ab absorbing. Of, what else have people thought? Mario absorbs the mushroom? A handful. What yeah. else? Is he's inspired briefly and then discards. <laughs> it's like, oh, this mushroom. Right. Yeah, does Mario regard the mushroom and think about it and then change? Like, what <laughs> is Mario doing with the mushroom, right? Like, is he doing the thinker pose and, like, looking at it? Um, this makes an interesting kind of question. Is Mario absorbing it? Is it that the mushroom touches his skin and then it kind of instantly makes him big? And the mushroom is so big, where does it go right. if he eats it? It, it makes is that why he's big? Is it just like filling up all the available space? Like, <laughs> right? Is there some kind of photochemical reaction that causes like the space between the atoms to expand and then it you know balloons up? And or is it like a what's the one in, in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory who eats the blueberry and and I mean is it that Veruca scenario? Salt? It's that situation. Well, not not Veruca Salt. And right. when something touches them, it pops. Oh no, sure. Right. Okay. So anyway, so this is gonna this sounds pedantic, but I want to think about more of these cases where. It's unclear of what actually the relationship is between the thing and you. Um, 
Inhaling, obviously Kirby's the great example of this, and Mario might be inhaling. Uh, certainly Bill Clinton did not inhale, if any of you are okay. old enough to know that joke. Um, <laughs> thank you very it's much. It's really funny. Those of you who are alive in the 1990s. The, the thing you threw looks like a joint. That so. looks like a joint. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, boy. Um, but the idea that you are kind of, uh, are you digesting it? Are you melding with it? I, w watching people play Mario Odyssey recently, I had similar thoughts about what is Mario actually doing to these things, right? And how is Mario learning so fast to adapt to them? And you know, what, what is it that is happening? Possessed. It's, yeah, it's, it's the, the possession. But I mean, inhale, so inhale makes sense because when we see Kirby inhale, there's an animation associated with it that looks like animations we would expect from a cartoon. Like there's the lines that make it look like the wind is moving and then the object moves towards you at a particular speed and so that acceleration you're like okay yes like this is a thing that could be represented as inhale not just eat because um, eating I don't know Kirby would be like walking up behind somebody and just <laughs> I would if, if it were me personally it would be if any of you've seen the show the critic the sound that Jay Sherman makes when he eats Akam 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 so another 90s yeah, thing for those of you Bill who Clinton and the critic Bill Clinton and the critic my, my references end in 1998 um, also, when we start to so have John a Lovett's bigger career. discussion, I'm fascinated by games that force you to overaccumulate things and then get rid of things, right? Because on a certain level, it's desirable to get objects in games. In Diablo, I'll pick up anything, regardless of rarity level, and then feel bad when I have to sell or destroy things. Um, games that have mechanics that let you get rid of things. So most commonly, you know, maybe following the interface sort of system of Windows operating system, we have trash or recycling. Um, some games you drop things on the ground, some games you give things away, some games you destroy things. So maybe what are the rhetorics involved in getting rid of stuff? Um, you know, if we were reading lifestyle magazines, there might be this kind of Zen language of like, you know, paring down for the season of, you know, getting rid of objects to simplify your life. And whether or not people know of games that are about precisely that, I'd love to hear about those. Um, unless you Bo have Border, hear me out. Borderlands is a game about four vault hunters tasked with moving weapons around the world. That's it, because like you get a gun and you use the gun for a while and you just like throw it away somewhere. And then so like all these guns are just like living their little happy lives and they're traveling around the world and going on an adventure with you and they end up in a new place. And what you are doing is irrelevant. They're like they're using you like bees and the, the guns are the pollen riding on your back to a new location to form gun communities. So you're thinking of a game that's the Borderlands from the guns perspective where the first ten hours are you're seeing the inside of the box, waiting for someone yeah. to pick you up. <laughs> someone picks you up, you start sort of saying to yourself, Wee! Yeah, Wait, right? Like, I'm running fun. everywhere. And someone the throws you on the ground. Hair. You have this, in, this incredible sadness as though you've been rejected by your family. It's me and a bunch of like shitty uh, shields just hanging out on the ground. Yeah, like, like, who's going to find us next? <laughs> so, if any, again, if any of you have venture capital this time, I think we might need more to make this yeah. game. Um, so, yeah, that's Borderlands. But avoiding and dodging mechanics, evasion mechanics, I'm fascinated by because obviously so many games are, you, you want to collide with some things but not with other things, right? That's a kind of common, you know, commonality. I don't know why I picked Wings of Fury for this. Has anyone played Wings of Fury? It's like a 80s uh, World War II. Oh, awesome. Okay. So Wings of Fury. Uh, Snake, for those of you who had graphing calculators uh, in school and, and immediately got this before doing any math, then Snake is a good example of Snake is you are colliding with things, absorbing them, that's good, but then you're also avoiding yourself. So on a certain level, it's kind of like this weird problem that I think is fascinating, even though it's among the simplest games you can both program and play. Um, but uh, some games obviously whole genres are built around evading things. Um, stealth games are largely built around not being seen, not entering sight lines, not triggering certain objects, not colliding with certain things. and. I'm fascinated maybe by how this mechanic gets moved to other areas. Um, so if, if we start to have thoughts about this uh, going forward, just a few more slides though before we start to kind of open it up more. Uh, sort of, I also want us to think about how if acquisition and getting stuff is a problem, then games give us a, a miniature version of what we face in the real world, which is that we have too much stuff, we're processing too much, we have to find ways to get rid of it or to do something new with it. For whatever reason, I picked the uh, incredibly arcane way of crafting in Dungeons and Dragons Online. But um, you know, if you know Kevin, it's not that's on brand yeah. for me. But um, the idea is: so, what is it that we can do to things to make them useful? How can we extract value from things in games? Is it a matter of repairing two objects to make them whole again? Is it a matter of taking the useful part out of the object? 
Um, is it just a matter of throwing, as you speculated, a bunch of guns around and littering a planet? You know, what is it that we're doing? Um, also, uh, going back to the vocabulary thing, how some words are incredibly specific when we get into crafting systems. So I'm kind of curious to hear about any crafting systems that have kind of interesting things to say about this. I have relatively limited experience with it. Um, combinations of the two, this is my obsession. I always talk about this for whatever reason. Diablo 2 is a good example of a game where getting and attacking are coded to the same action, and there's a kind of, you know, you click on the thing to both attack, but you also click on the thing to get it. My kind of little aphorism here is that video games sometimes are inadvertently very telling about what their kind of background is, and in this case, violence and accumulation are intertwined. You know, you can't get things without causing harm to others. I'm gonna get that with my sword. Right, you're gonna get the, the shiny thing by get it, getting into the flesh of the other uh, person, right? Hell so, yeah. But thinking about games that let you accumulate without hurting or, or disrupting maybe, versus the other example of what are some games that shame you for getting as much as you can, you know? I think that's a fascinating thing to play or to think, and whether or not those games actually make us not want to play them because we feel bad about what we're doing. Um, match and destroy mechanic I mentioned before I'm interested in, uh, about how in some games you want to combine like things with like things, but then also you get rid of them, and that maybe on a certain level, my little temporary obsession with getting rid of stuff in video games kind of finds a home here. So here's just two screens from somewhat dissimilar games. Um, the idea that sometimes it's a matter of finding the like thing in a game and then being done with it. Um, collecting objects so that you can destroy them. I don't know, getting the trophy which is immaterial but not having to carry around the set of armor, whatever it is, right? Um, so more examples to think of. Uh, to reference something from more recent decades, the song Blurred Lines in the title of this slide. Oh my God. Um, idle clicker games are fascinating to me. Do any of you play idle clicking games? Or, or games, I should say, because I think some people wouldn't even call them games. It's okay. Right. All of them count. Universal Paper Clips, Space Plan, Weed Farm, whatever. Yeah, Weed Farm sounds like a, it would be a crowd pleaser. Um, but games in which acquisition gets kind of, or the, the rhetorics that I'm thinking of or that we're talking about get kind of broken in both levels. So Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms is a game that scales to insane numbers. So by the end of it, you have a massive party. It costs you several trillion gold to gain a level with any given character. Every time you click, you do eight billion damage. You know, it, it kind of doesn't make sense why it scales that way. Versus the art game from many years ago from uh, this critic and and game designer Ian Bogos, Cow Clicker, where you could click your cow once per day, and it was supposed to be an exercise in kind of this zen-like kind of non... In, in, yeah, almost in not getting, right? To actually acquire anything in the game takes a lot of patience and, and effort and time. But you would, uh, you would get mo Mooney, and you would spend your Mooney on new skins for your cows, and the developer got really kind of dissatisfied with how people were playing at a certain point, and at one point removed the cows entirely, but people kept clicking on the blank spot mm -hmm. out of nostalgia, so we could think about what this is, right? What does, what is it, is it the, we're compelled to do the action? Is it, is it just a muscle memory? What is it, you know? Um, well, will we all find ourselves dying and our, and our last movements will be the twitch of our fingers? Oh, move, but damn it! <laughs> what do you say, move? Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna, let's get three limit cases and then let's open it up. I'm, I'm kind of tired of hearing myself talk. And does anyone play this game, Princess Remedy in a World of Hurt? It's a great free game on Steam. Uh, you, did you like it? Yes. Okay, I loved it. It was one of my favorite games I played last year on a whim. It's a great game thinking about how these kind of basic categories get reconfigured. So it's a bullet hell game that has the aesthetic of Game Boy Color. It is a game where you are going around a kingdom healing people. So you are shooting objects at others, but the iconography of those objects is of healing them from their maladies, much like Dr. Mario in some way. And then obviously you want to avoid getting hit by bad things. But to me, it kind of reconfigures the thing where when you defeat an enemy, you actually heal the person, so it's kind of flipping some of these categories. I thought it was an interesting kind of subversive take on some level of some of these problems that I'm thinking of. Uh, here's another one um, that Adam will talk about. Oh, yeah. This is the ultimate acquisition game. Uh, did some people play everything over the past year? Who played everything? Only a few people. Oh, man. Okay. Everything is a game where the ultimate goal is to become everything in the universe. Um, <laughs> you start off as a random creature in a random anywhere, and from there, you can occupy other things. You leave the thing you're in, 
and you enter something else. So you might start as a camel and become a palm tree, and then you're a speck of dust, and then you're a subatomic particle, and you work your way up and you're Jupiter, and then you fly around and become a, a mousetrap. It's crazy as hell, I tell you. <laughs> and there's just thousands of things that you can become in everything. And the whole idea um, is acquisition through occupation, but you're also vacating everything that you're in prior to that. And you're building a actual encyclopedia of knowledge to the point of absurdity. Uh, the game kind of culminates in this sort of quest that you find yourself on accidentally, where it ends in uh, absolute limbo and nothingness, where a giant piano is having a conversation with a tiny trumpet, and then like Mars will come over and turn into six galaxies. And it's just everything everywhere at all times in all space, and then nothing. And um, so I submit to the panel, this is now an award show, that this is um, kind of the, the most important, it's a procedurally generated universe kind of situation, that the acquisition in this game, because I think part of the one thing we're getting at, right, is um, the categorization, the inventory, the idea of how do you manage these things. And when you get to a literal list of all the items in the known universe and the filling out of that list, also it plays itself. So just a pitch for this game. You can just hit a button, and this thing will just go by itself. Does does this present that list to you of all the things that you can be? Like, is there like a record that no. you get along the way? So that's that's actually really cool about it, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you are going and becoming everything, but it's not like ticking off an inventory of all the things that you can become. There's subcategories, so you know that there's plant, animal, land, planetary, subatomic, whatever. So you can go and be like, oh, well, I've been an awful lot of the plants, but I sure as hell haven't been a cruise liner. And then you become a lamppost. And that is what this game is the entire way and through. On a certain level, for those of us, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are others here. I know Adam is one. I'm, I'm almost one who like to collect everything. We don't mm. ever know if we collect everything. And that presents a certain maybe uh, relief to some of us. I don't know. Ooh, but. It would be relieving in this game, except philosopher Alan Watts, uh, there's sound bites of his lectures questioning the identity of self throughout the entirety of this presentation. So as you jump through the different stratospheres of the world itself, becoming a continent and then a fire hydrant and then an ant with babies, Alan Watts is making you question the very fabric of your own existence. When I beat it, I cried. Wow. <laughs> and to, to that I say, what's up? Okay, um, so right. I, I want to hear from everybody now. So what, uh, we threw a bunch of stuff out there, but w what are some games you all have played that have interesting takes on some of this stuff where collision matters in a different way, where the verbs of what you're doing seem different, games that kind of make, make what, you assume, what we assume to be common different? I mean, I don't know if any, of, if any uh, thoughts came to mind when we were presenting examples of like different approaches to this, I, but part of, part of me wanting to do this panel is selfish. I want to hear about these games. I want to play more of them. So do, has people been thinking of thoughts as we kind of been talking? Uh, and, oh, sorry. Oh. I was going to add another thing to think about, too, in addition to this question, which is what games have you played that involve getting the most stuff, like a ludicrous amount of getting involved oh, in the losing. game? losing. You're also interested in where's the game where you give everything you got and you got right. nothing yeah. left. So my dream, game, my dream game coming from this is the zero inbox game where the goal of the game is to answer all the emails and delete all the emails and so that then you are left with the zero you know, message from Gmail or whatever and that you can go live your life, right? Maybe this is more about my psychological hangups than anything else. But mm -hmm. So Makes I saw yeah. a couple hands to get us started, but uh, let's, let's hear some, some thoughts right. uh, here. Oh, yeah. uh, in the back there, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, I think my relationship to it has changed over the years, as I'm sure other people's might be. At first I was very resistant to it, because uh, I, ideally I want to play a game on my terms as much as I can. I think I romanticize that I, I can do that. And now, especially if I'm playing a game in a, in, in a semi-tired state, just as a kind of means of winding down, I find myself trying to check off boxes on a to-do list more and more. And sometimes it's even taking precedence over the pleasure of the action. So I'll potentially take a shortcut to finish a quest rather than do as much exploration as I normally would have simply because on some weird level, the psychology got me. 
I don't know if I'm speaking for other people when I have that feeling, but for when ga these gamification elements first started to appear in games I played, I tried to avoid them. Uh, mm. But I think I've been worn down by the world, maybe. Adam, you're a completionist. Did, is this part, was your completionism before achievements and thinking about those types of things? Like, have you mm. always wanted to get all the stuff in games? Uh, yeah, I've always been a completion type um, in games that would have a system for it. So when they announced achievements and later trophies, like, that, that's my bag, uh, for better or for worse. So I do, I'm really into uh, trophy acquisition in games. And to me, it's two things. One... In my non-gaming life, I very much operate off uh, very intense to-do lists and get kind of that dopamine from working through things I need to do. Translating that into my play actually works to a degree, and seeing things get knocked off and done, be it in the game or in the supplemental list, is equally as fulfilling to me. Also, to me, on some, and this gets at the psychology of it, on some level, what a, let's say, a trophy list for PlayStation would do in relation to a game when I play a piece of media, if I want to experience everything that the creator intended me to with that piece of media, a trophy list is often a great way for me to be able to tell myself those side things, those hidden moments, those Easter eggs. Uh, I have seen everything you wanted me to see with your piece of media. And so that, that completion there. And you can also look at a list that comes with a game and be like, that's stupid. They just made that to like inflate the time or... Um, you know, it's very arbitrary to play this many matches, but a lot of the games I play tend to be narrative focused and thus have supplemental lists that drive you to uncover all elements of those. So narratives. achievements in that case would be like the developer wanting you to get other experiences. Yes. Uh, which is a, a nice a nice thing that's not just numbers going up. Many are rewarding too, and it's, and it's really interesting. So it feels kind of like a, a playing of the game. It feels like another way. But then there are sometimes moral problems I have with them where they force me to do things in the game that I don't necessarily want to do. Mm. Um, I'm, a, I'm a relatively simple man. I don't like to inflict undue pain on people in games. And so if there's an achievement for torturing somebody, I don't really want to do it. Yeah. So I, it, be, it comes, becomes a kind of philosophical problem for me, maybe. There's also games that just straight up do that. Yeah, right. and I tend not to play them. But mm. um, what is your relationship to trophies and gamification elements? Yes. Quick question. Yeah. Are That's you good. interested in them or do you dislike them? It's probably good for you. Oh, Witness, so good. Yeah, go for that platinum and the witness. The witness, <laughs> oh, let's not go down these rabbit holes. The witness, though, completing the witness in every which way is such a satisfying achievement, but it's because of the thing that you will inevitably do in the same minute that you get that completion. The last task in that game is richly rewarding. It's almost like you learned a language and it's your final exam. It's very satisfying. Persona. Oh boy. The, one of the tricks with like trophies and achievements is the idea that if the game presents it in such a way that you would not be able to rightfully kind of go after those beats without prior knowledge of all of it. Persona 5 or 4, any of them, you're not getting through without multiple playthroughs just on a numbers game alone. But it kind of stinks when you have to go and kind of familiarize yourself and be like, all right, I've got to make sure I buy all the books and all the days and read them on all my subways so I can get this in two playthroughs so it's not four. you got to get all the books so you can get all the friends so you can get all of the uh, demons in your compendium. And it just takes a lot, kind of, it, it, it can take away from the meat of the first playthrough of a game sometimes. And it's really sad when things are detrimental. But also if there's a game you love, they can be a great reason to keep going back to it. All right, I'll throw it back out. Uh, up in the front, we saw you the first time. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like my completionism sometimes overwhelms my ability to play a game with many choices, as in life. Just, you know, the thought, oh, no, you know, I'm not going to, there's no possible way that I'll make the right choices because there are too many choices. And, uh, but I do, I do like the, uh, um, yeah, it's probably something I need to mature on in gaming as well. But, um, yeah, I like the sort of the cute way that developers can communicate with you by mm -hmm. achievements. Mm -hmm. It might be a beginner's guide, I don't remember. Uh, where it's like, don't play the game for five years to try to get the achievement. Yep. <laughs> 
Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's that's my kind of achievement. I mean, it's it's a triple layered thing because you have the task itself, which is a commentary on itself, and then there's usually a title, which can be kind of ironic or just plain Jane. And then there's also a, an additional line to it. And is that line a descriptive hint? Is it sarcasm? Is it a joke? Is it kind of a reflective, this is a good thing, this is a bad thing? And then the actual trophy or achievement list itself, like if you look at Undertale when they put it to consoles, it was very clear that it's like, okay, I don't want to do this. Uh, just go spend all this money at this one location and you're maxed out kind of thing. Um, it, it, yeah, it's definitely a way the developer talks directly to the player that you don't get unless mm -hmm. you're looking online. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, and some games definitely do it better than others. Yeah, especially I mean, especially thinking about growing up as someone who played games in an era where you had fewer and fewer available intertext with which to like um, cloud your expectations. Now, in addition to things like that, I have any number of advanced things I've read about something, any number of uh, avenues to learn about something to kind of paint my expectations about what I'm going to be encountering, and then any number of ways to communicate with people about that experience. Whereas I feel like the years of game of playing games in relatively isolated environments and not necessarily knowing all those other avenues changed it. Uh, okay. Yeah, more uh, thoughts or, or, or examples or experiences? Yeah. yeah. I think of games like podcasts. There are certain games that I can play in a day or, or in a small period of time, like just as there are podcasts that are for a 30-minute commute. And then there's the, the you know, languid, uh, indulgent three-hour podcast that I listen to while I'm doing something very complicated. And then, and then there are the Persona 5s that are going to take me through the next you know, season. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great way to think about it. And, and I, but I appreciate having options in all those tiers. Right. You know what you I mean? To, you have to yeah. get all the games, though, so that you can get all the Stop. things that are in the games. Stop it. Stop it. I'm just going to give all my games away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so how do you consider, um, we, use, we use the word get a lot, but we can also consider um, games about escorting as a verb. Hmm? If you think about something like Ico or Lemmings or um, I, I just had a little bit of blank you, you, you would use the word I get and then I get this from one location to the other, but it's, it's a very different kind of get. You're not, in Lemmings, like I want a high score by, by getting them Yeah, escorting, conveying, those kinds of things. But yeah, we, we use the word get as a substitute for a lot of that. Um, you know, in the end, it's like, well, in Lemmings, a game like that, it's like, well, I got, I got a collection of Lemmings on the other side of the map. Um, and that is the record of my achievement, which is now I have this pile of lemmings. This bucket of lemmings? I don't know. What, what's the... It's a flock it's a of murder. lemmings. A murder, murder, murder of, of lemmings. lemmings. <laughs> no, that's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. That's also my Tumblr handle. <laughs> oh, yeah. If anyone wants to uh, buy murder of lemmings for, from him, he's going to sell it. No, I, I love that. And I, I'm glad you brought up the word get because I was also thinking as we were doing this about how we often say, oh, I get it. Like, we understand. Like, to get something sometimes implies to, like, have it affect you and have it be intelligible to you, right? But um, no, but but I like that, that that word you used as escort. I think that's actually a great kind of way to think about how you're you're trying to kind of maintain the safety of something else, but you don't have uh, you don't take permanent control of it. You don't keep it. You don't absorb it. You're just kind of making sure it's sort of safe in there. And I think that's actually a really great game mechanic to be explored in more genres because it's one that. I mean, you mentioned a couple games, and there are, of course, escort missions and, and different RPGs and things like this, but... I've been playing a whole lot of Bridge Constructor Portal, <laughs> and, and that is a very good game that does not involve getting stuff. You have all the stuff you need in the world, and all you have to do is, is triangle it together until the stuff goes from one side to another. Great. Uh, more thoughts, words, experiences? Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, that was, the, to me, that's the mental image, too. If you didn't yeah. hear it in the back, Katamari was the...
I'm sure it is. Uh, uh, the suggestion was that it, the background of Katamari is that it was a critique of consumerism and the, the way that we spend all of our time acquiring things. But the word that you use there, cleaning, as a way of describing it, is, is really interesting because those, those are cluttered environments. They're full of stuff. Um, and effectively, like, you, you get all the stuff, you make the stuff go away, and then you launch it into the sun so we don't have to worry about it, which is... Which is an amazing solution, forms. right, for any problem. No, but I love... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. They freak out. What you bring up to me too that I think is another thing that works in a lot of cases is when a game uses a word and insists that you're doing one thing but you're kind of actually doing another thing, right? So that, that this is the great logic of, you know, um, like, like almost the logic of corporations on some level where it's like, Customer pacification, what does that mean? You know, but it's like, oh, it means you're pleasing our customers. Oh, no, it actually means you're you know, blocking their phone number. I don't know. Like, right? So it's like you, the rhetoric seems to be suggesting one thing, but actually you're kind of doing another yes, thing. Yes, you're yeah. murdering humans and cats and dogs and other animals and giraffes. Right, right. Yeah. But ultimately, <laughs> it's in the acquisition of your father's affection and validation. Ah, get love. Yeah. You just want... Someone to yeah, love you. but I'm glad you brought up Katamari because in my head I was thinking about kind of that, just the image of what that looks like in that game. Uh, more, yeah, in the bad, in the green. green. Shirt, yeah, yeah, green. Yeah. Hey, so I was just thinking about Job Simulator actually. The only getting in that huh? really is getting Job done. Like getting things done. Like getting things done. 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 Mm -hmm. And so at one point, when I felt like the game was going too slow, I put a piece of money on the coffee machine, just printing out fake money, piling it in stacks on my desk, just to give my hands something to do while I was waiting for the game to go forward. <laughs> You know, seeing how people react to VR is really fascinating, and I'm glad, glad you brought that up because, like, what people love to do when they have hands in VR is to take stuff. Like, you, you get into a room, and you're like, I want this, and I want this, and fuck that, and this goes over here, and all this stuff, right? Like, I just take, 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 take. Um, and, and yeah, it's like, it just possesses us because now this, like, actual thing that we can do as humans is part of the mechanic. Mm -hmm. But that also, the example you gave also fascinates me because were it not a game, on some level, you might be like making copy of money and putting it on a desk and then being like, why am I doing this? Like what, you know, like <laughs> what is it about this environment that makes this actually seem like a cool thing to make do? Make that money pile up, Kevin. The desk starts out really cluttered with all kinds of crap. It's like, let's just add more money. That's basically it. Yeah. Well, I like that too, is that the game kind of is sort of wants you to clean the desk and you're like, no, I will not. And also I will add more to it. <laughs> Rather than get, I will make. Yeah, that's a great example. Uh, what are some more thoughts or examples or uh, approaches? Yeah, uh, in, uh, yeah, yeah, in the back kind of there, yeah. Oh, yes, you, yeah, sorry. I keep in, saying back. In, in but the black hoodie. There's like no definitive back really. With the white drawstrings. Yeah. There's a version of Tetris called Utilitris. <laughs> Futilitrous. That's a that's a great example that's and important. exactly the kind of thing that I think I need to do. Um, the but the, the makes me think of this question of scale. This is one thing that is, makes this interesting to me. So 
I think uh, as a gamer of a certain age, you know, the notion that a lot of games contain some equivalent of a bag of holding has always been a means that encourages you to collect, right? And so the, the difference between how many inventory slots you have versus what your avatar looks like, who maybe has a little like toy backpack and a little bedroll or something, but you can carry eight suits of armor and it, there's no consequences to it. The idea that you can scale like, you know, beyond any human capacity to get things but then this idea of, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll let you keep doing it, but you won't be able to see it because, you know, you can't comprehend what you're doing right now. I think that's actually kind of a good lesson in some ways. Are, are any of you all idiots like me mm -hmm. and are playing Animal Crossing Pocket Camp? Okay. Hey, idiot. What's up? <laughs> you're in the back. We're all in it together. So it's a game about acquisition, right? Because the Animal Crossing, like, you get a bunch of stuff, and then you sell that stuff so that you get more stuff, so you put stuff in your house, and you make friends. Um, but there is a limited inventory that you have for collecting the stuff in the game. So you're gonna go pick fruit and catch fish and bugs or whatever it is. Um, but then people are always asking you for it. And at some point they start asking you for more than, than you have. And then you go out and you collect a lot. And at some point you have more than you can hold. And then they just sell you unlock slots that you can pay for with the in-game currency oh. that you can pay for with money to be able to have more stuff. So like they're selling you the opportunity to have more stuff to give to more people to get more stuff. It's a stupid game. One of the dumb joys of early point-and-click games like, is you just have this growing inventory of stuff that was in limbo for you, the player, to use. Eventually, there's a self-awareness where you would see, you get to like Grim Fandango, and Manny Calavera is pulling stuff out of his cloak, and you can see that it's supposedly all on his person. Over time, you, know, you see players in these games, you see the characters, uh, reference like oh yeah I'll take that ooh that's that's gross I guess I'll take it for the puzzle and they reference how things might be large or not easy to hold or whatnot but they still take them but they also use it as an excuse sometimes in game design to say like I can't take that I can't pick that up what fascinates me most about kind of the modern evolution of that genre like the Telltale games Life is Strange that kind of thing is that you still have people acquiring those items, but when they do so, you get the animation of item to person with the implication that it went in a bag or a pocket, but you don't see that, and you hear the sound of it entering the fabric, and then you might get like a <laughs> ding that you did it. Russell, Russell. So Russell. it's like, oh, here's this gas can. Russell, Russell, Russell. <laughs> and you just see the hand do that, and it's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> We've gotten to the point where we'll do the animation and the sound effect and pretend there's a gas can in my back pocket, <laughs> but we don't justify it or, or do that in the game. Well, what, what game designers must know that most of us don't is that humans have kangaroo pockets and can put piping hot slices of pizza in them or something. Uh, yeah. No consequence. In Animal Crossing, I have pockets full of fish. <laughs> just yeah. fish everywhere. Mm. Um, okay, so we have about five minutes more. Were there other thoughts of uh, like uh, game types, experiences people have had, or, or things like this? Yeah. Uh, well, what you described sounds like work, just work <laughs> in general. But yeah, no, uh, he, we, I just watched him play a lot of Overcooked, actually, mm -hmm. over the last week. Um, and I was thinking about this a little bit. I don't know if there's a, a sort of clean genre term for that, but... I would add Paperboy to that list. Paper of just Boy, like, yeah. I got something, got to get it in my people. It's a, yeah. Again, it's like uh, Bobby's claim about Borderlands. It's kind of, if it's like redistributing things to specification. Like, making sure that this stew has tomatoes, onions, and blank, and moving the onions from here and to the chopping board and here and here and here. Yeah, recently people have called those like dash games based on Diner Dash, so that would be a shorthand for some of that stuff, but it certainly predates Diner Dash. But yeah, it's, a, it's about giving, it's about like sorting and then giving to somebody else. Yeah, there Give, needs to be a word to, yeah. Giving games. I don't think that's out there, but something where. Sorta, it, sorta games, because they both are no. sort of games no, and also no, games no. where no, you sort. we will okay. not be naming You it. can tell it's getting Bill uh, Clinton. close to the end of the, yeah, can you remember when Bill Clinton said, I did not inhale everybody? <laughs> or remember <laughs> when Jay Sherman ate like this? Akam, akam, akam. Uh, more, one or, we one or two more. We have time for one or two more. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was thinking about, like, being a completionist and what kind of broke me from that habit was open world games. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. other than for me to just acquire them and increase this number. 
Mm -hmm. It's true. And and games are kind of breaking themselves in that regard. I mean, look at Shadow of War last year. It's like a whole compact experience where you could conceivably 100% uh, it and have that full experience. And I was like, here's Shadow of War, and we're just going to bloat the hell out of the fourth act to the point where completing it becomes this battle of attrition. My personal know? version of that with no uh, real added element was... Getting every book in Skyrim into one of my five houses. <laughs> Taking every book I encountered and bringing it to one of my five houses and putting them on bookshelves and then running out of bookshelves. And that's what I do in life anyway because I like to buy kinda, books. That's what you yeah. do in real life. But I was like, I'm going to play Skyrim and just take every book. Why not? You know? Yeah. Having doubles of a lot of them. Yeah, it's, it's a curious thing. And open world games, like uh, it's interesting when they can... Um, scratch that itch and make you want to acquire those things. And I think some are getting smarter about having less like, there's not 500 pigeons everywhere. But there it's, are 700 some odd Korok seeds. Yeah, it is, but you don't feel compelled to collect those in I, the way you might the shrines. The number is so big as to be... As to being like... For, mm. for only certain types of people. Right, 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 right. Wherever you are. Uh, <laughs> how about in the back center over here? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so we'll say end end near talk. You're good. Um, but as as an example, yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, yeah. you, you're the completionist. You you like records. Yeah, that ending uh, near ends great. If you're looking for a game that does interesting things with stories, my favorite games are the ones that tell stories that you could not tell through any other medium. And near is a, a slam bang home run on that front. Um, the poof, the idea of having a record of it, I will say in two different regards. One, if a game for someone like me has a, a clean, straightforward, organized in-game system that tells me I have blank of blank or have completed one of so many, that's a lot more tempting because that scratches that organizational to-do tendency and it's more of that intentional design of the game developer that this was meant to be a part of the game. It bleeds back into what we were talking about with trophies and achievements where I might not play a game on the Switch the same way I would on the PS4 because there's that secondary level of goal with the trophies. So in a way, I think it, what you're asking actually even plays, you know, in a, in a basic level it plays into kind of a, a game with a percentage completion built into its actual menu structure, but it plays even more so into a game that has that meta level of achievements or trophies that kind of inform how much of that game experience you've completed, if that makes and sense. And then there's even the extra game record. Uh, so the notion of, I, this is not necessarily a dead thing, but taking a screenshot or photo of an inventory just to show that you have all of it. You know, me taking a photo of the 99 Genji gloves I have or something, right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and just saying, this is my record of it is not in the game, but it's something that I, I could pull out a photo or send a photo to somebody and show them. But your Skyrim house is actually a physical record of the thing that you've done, which is nice. Like, yes. it's not just an inventory. It's a place you get all the stuff and then you get to put it in a place and then look at all the stuff you got. Right. And getting it save files in particular, I think, is a very interesting concept. It's like you don't, after you go to the movie, do you keep your ticket stub? Some people like to, to say, like, I had that experience. Here is the physical proof. Some people like to read books and they only buy them because they don't want to give them back to the library or someone else because it's like, that's on my shelf, I read it, or I have to have the tangible version of a musical album in a digital world. And these are all ways to express either to yourself or others that I have experienced that piece of media. And I think save files beyond physical copies of video games do the same thing for video games. So it's a question of like, you play that game, you play the hell out of it, you finished it, you're never going to go back to it, or if you do, you're going to start from scratch. But that save file still on your drive. Do you feel comfortable mm -hmm. deleting it? And I think a lot of gamer folks would be like, no. What if? What if? That's, no. that's the, the closest thing I have to a record of the emotions and experiences I had with that game, those characters, or that uh, play. And I'm, I'm weirdly, I don't know, I'm 
uh, as a final thought maybe, I'm weirdly protective of my save files in the sense that they feel very personal, even if I didn't necessarily play a game in a unique way. I don't know. It's something about, it's like having, yeah. Like, yeah You're not going to go back to it. But, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to go back to but it. But the idea yeah. that you might, or that it means less that that experience is digitally yeah. gone is something. Uh, we actually have to wrap by, well, we have to wrap. Well, my name is Kevin, and nope, I'm here to nope, say no. Nope, nope. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't, didn't think about Another, the words that's I was a, saying. more of an 80s cadence, I think. Uh, I don't know. Is it, can you, why don't is you it, look outside and see if anyone's waiting to come in? If not, we can take a couple more. But I don't want to be those people. <laughs> okay, okay, so let's maybe just yes. do two more. Yeah. yeah. Um, so another, another game I just thought of, um, Little Inferno, where your goal yeah. is to acquire <laughs> it so you can burn it. That's good. <laughs> That's a good example. You're just burning things. You buy the whole game. You get, you get more money and more money for burning more and more things so you can unlock more stuff in the catalog to burn. And it's <laughs> fascinating to do it. And then if you play that game and you're like, what the hell, this is all I'm doing, keep playing it because it goes somewhere in the <laughs> end game. It's like, what the hell are you doing now, Little Inferno? Um, but it's from the same people who made World of Goo, oh. which is another game like where all you're doing is getting rid of goo balls all day. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that sounds weird. <laughs> uh, black hoodie. Yes. You, yes. Pointing to yourself next to the person in the green hoodie. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. How did I not know this existed? Oh, it's it's hilarious. It's goofy. Where where can I get this? It's PC. Is it on, is it on Steam? Is it a, just a, a mod of Half Life Two? No, it's or? a standalone. A standalone game. game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I would almost put that in the same like reverse bucket of Splatoon, where it's like <laughs> games where you're just like changing the environment um, and through the. I, I want to bring that phrase into circulation. It's like a reverse Splatoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's like you when you're just flipping line? Splatoon. Hey, baby, want yeah. a reverse Splatoon? Uh, not much tonight, just, you know, a reverse Splatoon. <laughs> There's a guy, drunk guy doing a reverse Splatoon in what the elevator. Mean? Just sucking paint off walls? <laughs> I don't know. Hey, don't knock it until you try it. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, uh, so, yeah, well, maybe one or two more. Yeah, uh, again in the green. I just wanted to say, Diaries was a space standard. I don't mm -hmm. know if you played that yeah. one, but you're picking up all the tracks that people have left on this spaceport, yeah. which you then sell so that you can buy other things. You're basically recycling other people's tracks. Yeah, yeah sort of like Little Facebook Inferno. Generator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's just about like taking one thing to convert it. Good, exa good yeah. example. I like that example. It's like a lot, an economy. Yeah. Oh, I think we may be uh, done with time or I don't know. No. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll just keep going until people say, in yeah. the mask. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of backpedaling just a, a sentence. Uh, something that's kind of like a reverse Splatoon, but it's not like a Splatoon, but it's like a Mario Sunshine where you're going to clean up all the time. Uh huh. That's true. That is the reverse that Splatoon. That is the reverse Splatoon. Splatoon. <laughs> it's the flood <laughs> system. For Mario Sunshine. Well, that's defined and now we're done with it. Oh, yeah. my God. Could you imagine if they did uh, DLC where one team had the flood backpacks on for Splatoon? <laughs> <laughs> and be the paint guns versus the flood? Oh, wow. Look, it's the same it, game. Stop it, stop it, stop it, it It's it. simply a, a skin. And then you have a character who installs drains in the ground so that it can all... Yeah, that's the special power. Yeah. All right, well, this will be our last one and y'all yeah. can go. Yeah, where the bulk of the story is told through the items the that you acquire yeah. themselves. Yeah, and that's that's always an interesting genre because, like, to the degree at which people choose to engage with mm -hmm. that, where a lot of people just don't care, and to a lot of people that, you know, others, that is the full experience, is getting those things and diving in and chewing on that story. And, and a lot of games... Combat, yeah. Combat, yeah. A, a lot of games that do that kind of, like, environmental storytelling with those elements don't allow you to take those things. So, like, if you're walking through your house and gone home, like, you don't get to have this stuff. Like, you pick it up and you look at it and you set it back down. And, and now you have, like, the memory of that thing. But it's not about acquiring all those objects. It's mm -hmm. about engaging with them. It's a great, vague word, interact, I think. Um, just a couple of plugs real quick. First of all, thank you all for coming to the panel. It's a lot of fun to talk about this, to, you know, maybe uh, get some people some ideas about new games things like that. Uh, we're doing a 
audience participation D and D game mm-hmm. tomorrow or Saturday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, three thirty. It's called Roll for Magfest, um, and then we are uh, Adam and I are part of Video Game Improv, which is coming up on Saturday. So please check those out. And Bobby, you're running. Uh, 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 also tomorrow on Friday, um, I'm helping run the tabletop game jam that's over here in one of the other mages' rooms. So if you've ever wanted to make a game, come find some like-minded people and make a game in two hours and play it and have fun. Great. Mm-hmm. So have a good Magfest. Thanks again for coming and take care. Go get some fun. Yeah.